the Sins at Boston Avenue podcast. I am Philip Boone, and today I'm here with Reverend, Reverend Sarah P. Montgomery, an associate pastor here at Boston Avenue. How are you doing, Sarah? Doing pretty well today. Today we are going to be talking about Lent. So I have a list of questions for you, and I hope you're ready and you've studied up. I'm ready. I Googled. <laughs> the first question is, Sarah, what is Lent? Well, Lent is actually derived from our Anglo-Saxon word, Lenten, and that means spring. And so it's this special time where we as Christians have a period of fasting and almsgiving and um, reflection and penance where we can prepare ourselves for the season of Easter. And so Lent was a time for also, um, historically, Lent was a time to prepare new converts for baptism. So during the time of Lent, in the season of Lent, often there were no baptisms, and the baptisms all happened during an Easter vigil that was on Saturday night at the first sunlight, um, or at the first turn of the night into the day of Easter. And they'd have this great, huge celebration of um, all of their converts into the faith. Lent is the time leading up into, into Easter. It is 40 days. What's the significance of the 40 days? Why is it that length? Well, there's been a lot of different times within the biblical narrative where 40 days comes up. Um, but for Lent, it's mostly reflecting the 40 days and the time that Jesus was tempted by um, the devil in the desert. So right after Jesus' baptism, he was thrown by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted. And so those 40 days um, reflect the time that Jesus was tempted. And so that way we can be a part of um, being a part of that desert experience as well. Lent um, always starts with Ash Wednesday. What, why do we put ashes on our forehead during that time? What is the significance of the ashes? Yeah, ashes. So, you know, usually ashes are something we try to avoid. They're, you know, in the fireplace and we don't want to get dirty and messy. But ashes are a symbol of death and a symbol of um, what is now gone. And so since Lent is a season of repentance, we're, um, we're looking and reflecting on what needs to go away and what needs to be able to disappear. And so, um, but Ash Wednesday also marks this time as we are looking towards Easter of knowing that Christ died as well during this season. And so um, the beginning of Ash Wednesday also reminds us of our own mortality as well. And so as pastors, we often say that from dust you came, and to dust you shall return, which reminds a person that they were um, brought into this world and claimed by God, but that they will die one day. And so those ashes are the symbol of that. And then we also encourage them to repent and to believe in the gospel. So that sort of sets their season for Lent, um, a season of repentance and belief within that gospel narrative. So it sets the next 40 days. <laughs> Absolutely. And what you're going to learn in church and go through the Holy Week and everything that's a part of that. During Lent, people give up something or and sometimes take on something. What is the purpose of giving up? up something for Lent. Sure. And this is also a part of our Ash Wednesday service. We have a, a time during Ash Wednesday service where we encourage the congregation to have a special observance of Lent. And in that invitation, we encourage folks to be able to give up something or to take on something. Now, we, we always like to remind people it's not a New Year's resolution, so it's not in order to lose those last five pounds that you gained over the holidays. Um, but instead, it's a way to be able to grow closer to loving God and to loving your neighbor. So the action that you might take on or um, might remove from your life is something that would draw you closer to loving God and to loving neighbor. And so during these um, 40 days of Lent, we purposefully practice those actions so that that way we can get into the practice of loving God and loving neighbor more, just as Christ invited us into doing it within the world. And then you can see a lot of times if you're able to complete that during Lent, maybe continue it oh, throughout absolutely. the year. Is yeah. kind of the goal a lot of times. So you can yeah. beca become closer to God and Christ. Right. So you might, you know, so for instance, if somebody gives up Facebook for the whole season of Lent, um, perhaps they'll take back Facebook after the Easter holidays, so after Easter Sunday, but they might put more restrictions around it and, and instead do something different. Um, but if somebody takes on a new spiritual practice, 
there's a, um, you know, a little saying that it only takes about 30 days to start a new habit. And so that th- we have 40 <laughs> to be able to start that new habit. And so we're hoping that it's not just something that you do for this time frame, but instead is a, a part of your life that you'll continue to develop. Why do we not include Sundays in the giving something up? Because Ash Wednesday isn't exactly 40 days before Easter. It's 47, Mm -hmm. I believe. 47. Um, So Sundays are not included in the 40 days of Lent. Why is that? So during our season of Lent, we always talk about how, and, and during the whole year, we always talk about how every Sunday is a little mini Easter. So it's a time to be able to, to celebrate resurrection and hope and new life. And so even during, and probably more importantly, especially during the season of Lent, we want to have those celebrations and those moments of many Easter's and many resurrections. Um, now, there's still some parts within Sundays that um, some Methodist churches and other denominations exclude, such as a lot of folks do not use um, the phrase Alleluia during the season of Lent, or they might not use any of their white pyramids during the season of Lent um, to kind of put a different tone to those Sundays. Um, But it's always a little mini celebration time. And so we want to, um, you know, my my Lenten discipline this year is, is in practicing the Sabbath and my spiritual director kind of talked to me about how the Sabbath is not a list of can't do's, but instead a list of what God is saying yes to so that we can live life more fully and live life in seeing God within the world. So I think that's also a beautiful way of kind of understanding those many celebrations that are there in Sundays. When I was in elementary school, I remember trying to manipulate the system um, with Lent because Sundays are, many Easter's Mm -hmm. are not a part of the 40 days, so the giving up. And I decided to give up donuts. But the only reason I decided to give up donuts was because the only time I ate donuts was on Sundays. (laughs) So every once in a while, you'll have people there like, wait a minute, what do I do on Sundays? That's what I'm giving up. That's right. They'll buck the whole (laughs) system. Yes. So my um, third grade mind was was thinking about what I could get away with. Yes. Do not use the (laughs) Philip Boone model of Linton (laughs) discipline and preparation, as I would like to know how that drew you closer to God during that Linton season. Oh, no way at all. Yeah, exactly. But, so but, that is not our purpose. Well, as an adult, I haven't done that. That was that was my um, third, third grade, grade third grade mind thinking, and my parents would probably remember that. They probably just sighed and rolled their eyes at me. But you know. Well, and I have a really funny story from young Sarah as well. I was in first grade, and so was in um, New Jer- New York. We were living out in Staten Island, and my parents were. Um, fasting during the season of Lent and they had explained to me what fasting was and and I was like well I want to do that and they were like Sarah you can't you're still really young you know you're not allowed to fully fast and and so they talked with me and about some things that I could do and so I said okay well I'm gonna give up sweets then and they were like now are you sure because if anybody knows me now I am have a sweet 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 tooth and I totally did back then as well and I was like yeah I'm gonna do it well, my plan got foiled during the the last week of Lent when my grandma sent me my Easter package. And so my Easter present was a new Easy Bake Oven. And so I was like, oh, my goodness. So I went upstairs. I went, oh. You got your Easy Bake Oven. You started baking stuff. Wouldn't it have, waited, wouldn't it have been ready after Easter anyways? It totally would have, <laughs> but I'm in first grade. Patience is not a virtue yet for first graders. So instead, so I had opened up my Easy Bake Oven and I go upstairs and I was, you know, I, I talked to God. And so I come back downstairs and I'm like, okay, mom and dad, here's what God and I, we made a deal. <laughs> I'm going to be able to use my Easy Bake Oven for just today if I continue my Lenten fast for one more day after Easter. And so they were like, okay. Now what I did not know is that, so I did that. I used my Easy Bake Oven, had some delicious brownies. They were delicious. And they were they were cooked all the way? Cooked, all, right, cooked all the way. They were great. It was a great new Easy Bake Oven. 
And then on Monday, I go to school, and it turns out that we're having an ice cream sundae party within my classroom during school. And I was like, well, I already bargained with God once, so... I decided not. You, you, you bargained with God and God thought, just you wait. Exactly. Just wait, just wait till you get to school. Exactly. So I sat through the whole <laughs> ice cream sundae and did not eat anything from the whole party. <laughs> did anybody ask you why you weren't eating anything? Yeah, and I told them why and I'm about my Easy Bake Oven. And so it was, <laughs> but it's just always, it's this hilarious thing of like, you know, you think that you've dealt with God and, and been able to like scheme God out of things and then you have an ice cream sundae party show up and it's right there in front of your face. <laughs> now, um, whenever you, and you might have mentioned this, when you baked from your Easy Bake Oven, did you do that exactly one day before Easter that you ate that? Two days So you Easter. should have really gone until Tuesday. Yeah, I should have waited. <laughs> I totally should have waited. <laughs> but that wasn't the bargain. Yeah, it wasn't part of the bargain. The bargain was I was going to use it one day and so I'd have to extend my Lenten fast for one more day. <laughs> Impressive. I'm, I'm impressed that you were able to hold off on the Sundays. Yeah, little six-year-old Sarah somehow did not eat ice cream. I don't know how in the world. <laughs> All right, um, the liturgical year, there are colors that go with each season. Lent is the color of purple. What is the significance of purple during Lent? Yeah, purple is a, a, a color that really symbolizes pain and suffering, and so is also kind of calling us into this time of mourning and penitence. And it's also the color of royalty. And so during the season of Lent, we're also sort of acknowledging that Christ is our king and, and you know, and that we're a part of um, the kingdom of God here on earth. And so what that really looks like. And so, you know, we'll be talking later on about Holy Week, but the beginning of Holy Week marks that um, that reign in a new and in a different way as well. And so that that purple sort of symbolizes that whole time frame as well. Okay. Christmas is on December 25th. Correct. No matter what happens that year, it's December 25th, same day every year. Easter kind of jumps around. Last year it was on April 1st because I remember um, Ash was Wednesday was on Valentine's Ash, Ash Wednesday was Valentine's Day and then Easter was on April Fool's Day. Um, this year it is April 21st, 21st. I believe. Yeah, 21st. So what? how is the date of Easter decided? How... Does that happen? Well, you know, it's a bunch of old people getting together in a room and sort of <laughs> figuring out when Hallmark needs to sell <laughs> their best Is that actually stuff. what they do during general conferences? No. Is that every four it's years? That's not what happens. That's what they decide. <laughs> so it's all based, as many holidays are, it's, it's based on our lunar calendar. And so Easter is celebrated the first Sunday after the full moon that occurs on or just after the spring equinox. And so that full moon is referred to as the Paschal full moon. And Paschal is um, also thought of as the lamb, which we think of the lamb as being Christ. And so, um, so in 2019, the equinox is March 20th, and that full moon is also on March 20th. Um, and so it turns out that in order to make it a little bit easier, we wanted to be able to, um, to determine that it was the complete, that Easter would be after that first full moon. So not exactly on that day. Oh, yeah. And so I, with that thought of how Christmas always stays standardized, there was a time within my beginning time of ministry um, I think I was in my second year at my church in Virginia and just very early on in my ministry. And it was the year when we had Christmas Eve on a Saturday and then Christmas was on Sunday. And so we had um, four Christmas Eve worship services on Saturday. And then because Christmas is on a Sunday, we came back and worshiped together on Sunday morning. And it was super fun. We were all in our Christmas PJs and we sang a bunch of Christmas carols and just had a grand time. But I had gone home after that and was packing up my car so that I could head um, somewhere and be with my family during the Christmas season. And I had um, looked up and, and saw that there was a full moon outside and I and I sat there and I pondered and thought to myself I wonder if Christmas also moves around like Easter and that it's based on the lunar calendar and it was in that moment that I asked that question that I realized Sarah you need to go back to bed 
you should not be driving a motor vehicle at this moment because you are way too tired to operate the, the, that. Because Christmas doesn't change. Christmas does it not does. change. And you'd already gone to seminary by this point, so Indeed. you knew. And that- I'm like 27, 28, so like I've celebrated multiple Christmases, always on December 25th. And so I was just purely exhausted. But I thought, you know, I was like, that's actually pretty intuitive of myself to think that at hey, the time, maybe with no sleep. With no sleep, maybe the lunar calendars are similar. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have a story. This is actually story time story with time. Um, Sarah and Philip, and um, it actually completely gets away from Lent because I your Christmas idea or your thought about Christmas reminded me of a story about Christmas being on a Sunday. This goes back to another time when I was in elementary school, and my parents will remind me almost every year about when this happened. But Christmas Eve. Or no, Christmas was going to be on a Sunday Mm -hmm. the following year. Mm -hmm. And they will remind me, as soon as Christmas ended, the previous year, I started complaining right then about (laughs) having to go to church on Christmas. And it was a awesome. it was you a year long complaint. Four days of complaining. <laughs> yes. No, that is I mean, impressive. Losing the irony of the fact about I should want to go to church That's on right. Christmas because That's of what right. Christmas actually represents. Correct. <laughs> but yeah, they they will always talk about. It. Remember that one year that you just complained about Christmas being on a um, Sunday? I don't know if I did the full year. Um, at one point, I might ha- when Christmas comes, I might have to call them in and have them be on the podcast yeah, to explain. let's find out. Because I want to know like, the persistence of <laughs> Philip Boone. <laughs> that's I would, impressive. I, I, I was very persistent. But yeah, cr- when Christmas Eve is on a um, Saturday and the Christmas, that's a hard weekend. Oh, yes. Because <laughs> that's a, a lot of church services. Yes. <laughs> um, I want to go back to giving something up that I'd forgotten to ask Whenever it's time to give up something for Lent, when Ash Wednesday come around, it's sometimes hard to think about what to give up mm-hmm. or what to take on. Mm-hmm. I try, if I give up or take on something, I try for it to be um, not necessarily a personality trait, but kind of like that. Like mm-hmm. I want to take on more patience mm. with my two-year-old. <laughs> Yeah, truth. I hear you. <laughs> or, you know, something like that, like where it's not something tangible. Mm-hmm. But what are some creative ways that if somebody's having a hard time thinking about what to give up or what to take on, that they could, what, what are creative things that they could do? Sure. Yeah. I love that question. Um, oftentimes when folks are thinking about their practice for Lent, um, I remind people to think about what is it that keeps you from um, from being able to love God and to love neighbor your best. And so some of the practices that I've heard over the years that I thought have been very creative and just really kind of unusual practices um, is one year a woman at my church in Virginia, she uh, was a, a woman that was a physical therapist. And so she would often have people on her um table and and she'd just be listening to them and hearing what all they were saying and so um she but sometimes she would get annoyed with them and so during the season of lent she decided that she was always going to focus in a positive way about thinking about that person that was on her table um and and kind of shining god's light into their life and so um, that was just a great practice for her to not think about people in a negative manner. And then um, another year, uh, a whole church in Virginia, they actually gave up um, complaining. And so they were, um, they wore <laughs> uh, rubber bands around their wrists. And whenever they would complain, they'd have to snap their rubber band and then switch it over to the next hand. And so kind of this act of being able to remind themselves, oh, you just complained, but then also kind of switching those bands over. Um, And that was a great practice because they started to realize that, you know, sometimes our complaints are are out of some, you know, injustice or or something that's really going on within the world. But then sometimes it's also just very minute. And it's, you know, complaining that you're not traveling as quickly as you'd want to travel or, or complaining that, your two-year-old's on the floor again and throwing a tantrum. <laughs> that was going to be my question. Is um, Well, not about particularly that, but what did they have variations of complaining? Like, did they have degrees? And and 
do they only do the harshest degree or even like, oh, I'm so tired. That would be a complaint. Yeah. So they, well, so and so it had um, their whole practice also followed with a sermon series. Oh, okay. So each week the pastor was preaching about complaining. And so they would have a way of kind of learning something new about complaining and how that directed us away from God and away from neighbor. Um, and then one year um, I was... We had just started up a homeless ministry at um, my church, and so I wanted to kind of take on learning more about what it meant to be homeless. Um, and so I, you know, I I um, chose not to not live within my home or um, anything like that. But so I, I learned. I kind of wanted to. So I asked myself, sort of, what is something that I could do? Um, and so what I did was I packed a suitcase and lived out of that suitcase and had to travel everywhere I went with that suitcase. So, you know, because when you're homeless, you also don't have a space to store your suitcase or your items. And so I, um, you know, put everything that I would need or thought that I would need for that season of Lent, including I was traveling and going on vacation a couple of times. And so anything was that I would need would be within that suitcase. And so I would take my suitcase to the grocery store. I would take my suitcase to um, dinner. I would take my suitcase everywhere um, that I would go. And it was a wonderful practice of being able to, to really become more aware of, of what a person who is homeless has to experience every day as well. And so, um, so those are kind of a couple of really great kind of more creative and out of the box examples. Um, somebody this year is sending a text every day to 40 of her friends and people that she engages with and are you I, on I'm, that too? I'm getting that yes! text. <laughs> I know. I love it. And so it's a word of encouragement every day. And I think that's a great discipline because, you know, what a thing to do to in, to be a part of loving God and loving people more is mm-hmm. to encourage them and think of something positive to send to them every day. And that's something that people don't think about, just yeah. sending a word of hope to everybody each day. Or... Absolutely. What is Boston Avenue doing as a church during Lent? What's going on at Boston Avenue? Sure, yeah, we are. Um, so as a church this year, we have actually decided to um, to kind of encourage folks to practice um, some new disciplines or some new practices by having a Lenten calendar. And so um, some things on that Lenten calendar, like for instance, last week we had to not complain for 24 hours. Um, this week we were encouraging folks to be able to sit in silence for five minutes and to listen to God. Um, today we're encouraging people to not look on their electronics or any of their other devices for, as entertainment um, after five o'clock. And, and then we'll continue that out to being a whole day thing later on. Um, but we're sort of encouraging our whole community to participate in these different practices. So, um, and it's great because for families, it's a different experience each day. So sometimes little kids, it's harder for them to latch onto one thing and to do that for the whole time frame. Um, even for adults, sometimes it's a little hard as well. So this kind of gives a different um, new practice. And then we're encouraging people to be able to post that on social media and to put the hashtags of um, Be the Church, which is our theme for the season of Lent, and um, Boston Ave Lent 2019. And so that way we can um, just be a part of witnessing to the fuller Tulsa community as well. And, you know, even some of my folks that know me on the East Coast and other areas are commenting, oh, that's a great practice. Maybe I'll take that on for the, you know, rest of the season of Lent. Because if you don't start something on Ash Wednesday, it's not like you can't do anything, you know. So we want to encourage folks. This is, it's a particular season, but you can always um, take on practices any time of the year. So this is just the time where the church really focuses in on that. This has been a podcast about Lent. Um, Holy Week is also a part of Lent, but we will be discussing Holy Week, Sarah and I, on the next podcast that'll should come out the week of Holy Lent that Monday, or Holy Week, <laughs> Holy Lent. <laughs> it's always a Holy Lent. <laughs> of Holy Week um, that Monday. So we'll delve deeper into what is Holy Week and what makes up Holy Week. Um, this has been Reverend Sarah Pugh Montgomery. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure this to be been, here. This has been fun. And um, and you can see, Sarah, she is often at either the traditional service or... Um, 
Or you can also see her at the 13th Street Worship. Can you tell us more about that particular service? Sure, yeah. That's our new um, modern worship service. So we have music that might be music that you hear a little bit more on the radio, but we also kind of have ways of using hymns kind of in a new way. Um, And then we have a children's time. So it's a service that we really engage the kids actively within the worship time. And um, then we often have a response to the sermon. So um, it's a little bit more interactive. We always have communion each week um, that we worship together. And um, so you can kind of move around a little bit more. uh, And, you know, we're over there in the Jubilee Gym. So and we worship right now two times a month. So we will be worshiping on March 24th Mm -hmm. and then also on April 14th. And we'll have a service on Easter Sunday as well. So are are they usually the same Sundays each month, like the middle two or generally they're the third, the second and the third, but it, um, sometimes if something's going on like this week, we had Bishop Snazy and Mm -hmm. there's no way I'm preaching against a Bishop. So (laughs) (laughs) we did not have our worship service. So we moved it to the week prior. Excellent. So if anybody is doesn't want to come to a more traditional service and they want to find a more contemporary or um, a, a service like that that they can bring their family to Absolutely. and there's stuff to draw and there's um, activities for the kids to do, um, you can definitely come there. Um, yeah, we'd love to have yeah, you. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, we are located at Boston Avenue United Methodist Church, 1301 South Boston. This has been Ascends at Boston Avenue podcast, and thank you for listening. We will see you next time. Mm-hmm.